First reading can be found on page 794 of the Bible of the Northeast. It's taken from Jeremiah chapter 31, and I will start reading at verse 31. So I'll see verse 31, verse 34. <clears throat> the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judea. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbour, or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness, and will remember their sins no more. The second reading is taken from the Gospel according to John, chapter 12, verses 1 to 16, and it's 1079 in your Bible. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, and Jesus was raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given from Jesus in honour. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took a half litre of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Jesus Iscariot, who was amazed to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this person sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, replied Jesus. It was intended that she should save this person to the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. The next day, the great crowd who had come to the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on the donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him, and that these things had be done to him. 
Let's pray. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Amen. Well, the reading for Palm Sunday this year, John 12, and do keep that open if you would, page 1079, uh, it happens to fit exactly with where we're up to in our Sunday readings of John's Gospel. You may remember we stopped a good few weeks ago, I think it was before Christmas, that we um, got to the end of John chapter 11. We've been having a series where we do a few chapters of John over a few weeks and then do something else for a bit and then come back to John. And this is where we happen to be up to as well, John chapter 12. So uh, we're taking just one more step today in our journey through John. <clears throat> Four Gospels describe a woman anointing Jesus. And they're not all describing the same incident, at least two, possibly even three uh, times this happened that women anointed Jesus. Matthew and Mark, I think, are clearly describing the same event. And Luke, in chapter 7, describes something happening early in Jesus' ministry in Capernaum, up in Galilee in the north, in the home of Simon the Pharisee, where the woman with a reputation for immorality anointed Jesus, and there's an argument about whether Jesus should have accepted tribute from her, given her reputation. I'm quite sure that that's a different incident from what happened in John 12, today's reading where we're not told whose house it was in, but it's in the south, near Jerusalem, in Bethany, where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. Martha served, and you get the impression it might have been in their house. Matthew and Mark's accounts take place also at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry in Bethany, in the house of a man named Simon. And we're not told this Simon is a Pharisee, but his nickname is Simon the leper. Simon is clearly a very common name. They have more Simons than we have Ian's or Tim's. <laughs> so they uh, have to have nicknames as well. And Matthew and Mark don't say very much about who the woman was, but the following dispute was not about Jesus' attitude to her, but about whether the perfume should be sold and given to the poor. That same issue is disputed in today's reading of John's account, which we read today. But John tells us it was before the Palm Sunday triumphal entry, where Matthew and Luke describe it after the event. So one view is that they're describing similar, separate events. Something like this happened twice within a few days. But I think Matthew and Mark are arranging their material non-chronologically to make their points about Jesus. <clears throat> Matthew and Mark don't mention Judas, but the disciples objecting. That's plausible. John singles out Judas, either because he was the main spokesperson or because he was amongst them and John has been reflecting on Judas's heart. John also says it was Mary who anointed Jesus, whereas the other two don't mention, this. I don't mention her name as it's not relevant to their point. There are often questions when we read different account differences between the Gospels that uh, it may be helpful sometimes to explore and think, do they contradict each other? I believe they don't, and there are always turn out to be ways that um, <clears throat> they do fit together with a bit of thought. Three observations now from the anointing of Jesus at Bethany. First, there is powerful evidence of Jesus' greatest miracles. And the miracle that is in view here is we have read in chapter 11. Do you remember? Lazarus was out of the tomb who died and was alive again. The raising of Lazarus. 
had caused quite a stir. And uh, I imagine I would be really curious to meet this guy if he had had that experience. He died, and is he really alive? Well, yes, he is. He's there at this meal, reclining at the table. He's eating. He's not a ghost or some kind of apparition that some people claim to have seen and maybe it was a trick of the light or something like that. He's actually there and you can go and talk to him. And this was causing many people to pay more attention to Jesus. He actually had the power to do this thing that backed up his claim to be the resurrection and the life. And so people were curious to talk to uh, Lazarus. And you see it in um, that it was causing people to, to trust and follow Jesus as a result in verse 11. And then uh, on in verses 17 to 19 as well. Uh, it meant that Jesus' opponents really wanted to get rid of Jesus as well um, in verse 10. And then verse 18, many people, because they heard Jesus had performed that sign of raising Lazarus, went out to meet him. It was really annoying the Pharisees. The greatest miracle of Jesus was not the raising of Lazarus, but the resurrection of Jesus himself. And there's extraordinarily powerful evidence for that as well. We may feel that we, we miss out because we weren't there to see it with our own eyes. But it's well worth looking into the evidence. If we're feeling doubtful or skeptical about Jesus <coughs> being dead, this Easter, why not get hold of a book about it? Or at least read the little leaflet, um, which we've got James about to wave it for us. Thank you, Jane. Um, which is some questions and answers about Easter, separation back from fiction for Easter. Uh, if Jesus really rose from the dead, um, then that is good reason to take him very seriously indeed. And as we hear his words, to trust and follow. We also see from this anointing that a person, Mary, that has experienced Jesus' love, she's had her brother returned to her alive out of the grave. She's got to know Jesus over the last couple of years and experienced his love. And her response is to show him love. We were talking last week about whether it's okay to be the part of love in Jesus. And no, he requires us to be all in. And Mary certainly is here, uh, where she produces this extraordinarily valuable jar of perfume and pours a whole lot on Jesus. <clears throat> People who love Jesus will get criticized. And uh, in verses 4 to 8, it's Judas who speaks up and clearly doesn't like what Mary has done, this expression of love to Jesus. But he can't say, I don't like that, I don't think you should show love to Jesus. That would be too, too straightforward. He would be losing face if he said that. So the way around it is to, to think of something better she could have done instead. She could have sold the perfume and given the money to the poor. But Jesus uh, says she's done the right thing. Leave her alone. It was intended, verse 7, that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. So she did the right thing, even though people thought she was doing wrong. 
And some people hate Jesus. You see that in verses 9 to 11, where the chief priests want to kill Jesus and even Lazarus because he's causing people to follow Jesus. Uh, and also, really, in Judas, who didn't like the expression of love for Jesus, <clears throat> the disciples haven't realized it at this stage, but John, looking back and knowing what Judas did later, can't mention his name without saying he was later to betray him. Judas clearly was, was resenting, for whatever reason, Jesus. And we might struggle with understanding why people would hate Jesus. But does anyone know what T-B-F-T-G-O-G-G-I stands for? Fair but for the grace of God, okay. There is this evil in every human heart, and let's pray that he would keep us from that turning away from Jesus, that rejection of Jesus. And God, in his grace, has brought those of us who trust him to, to trust and follow and love him. And we need him to keep our hearts in that place. Now, on this Palm Sunday, let's think about the so-called triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, where, again, we have an incident that is described by all four Gospels in their different ways. And this time, I'm pretty sure it is the same incident being described by each of them. And here are three things to note from John 12, 12 to 16. First, Jesus Christ went public. It's been in the news on Friday, hasn't it? The Princess of Wales has been keeping something private to her cancer diagnosis. Very understandably. But decided the time was right on Friday to go public with it, to, to share it with <coughs> the nation. And so uh, it's drawn a lot of sympathy, understanding, respect, um, honor, and support as a result. But the timing had to be right for that family. And for Jesus, in his earthly ministry, he spends a lot of time with his disciples, with a few people, teaching them, training them. And some crowds of people came to follow him and sort him out in the remote places that he went. But a lot of uh, what he was saying was quite private, and he was very conscious of timing of the events that were going to unfold once he went public in a big way, as he did in today's reading. So many men a few days until his arrest and uh, execution and the story that in um, many ways is, is echoed by the story that that's in the valley of the year for bringing that to us. Jesus going public is uh, bringing the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy, where it's not just a few people that know the Lord, but all God's people will know from the least to the greatest. And uh, everyone could see Jesus going into Jerusalem. And the way that he went into Jerusalem was so extraordinary. He went to Jerusalem even though he knew he was going to be killed there. Jesus Christ suffered voluntarily. He told his disciples that he was going to be rejected and would suffer and die. And their natural thought then was, well, if that's going to happen in Jerusalem, let's go the other way. Let's stay away from there. But Jesus 
set his face to Jerusalem and quite deliberately went into the city where he knew he would be rejected and would have to suffer and die because he had a plan. His death was not things going wrong. It was for our salvation in God's big plan for the world. That the obedient son of Lord Jesus who would voluntarily give himself up to suffer for us. And it was clearly, as we see in this, where he finds a donkey and rides in into Jerusalem, his choice, it was voluntary. And in doing this, Jesus Christ fulfilled prophecy, and specifically John spots Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. It's in John 12, 15, and he quotes it. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. The King of Israel, the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, not coming on a war horse, as he has helped us to think earlier, but coming in humility and peace, riding on a donkey. The natural understanding of, of that, the people in Jesus' time, looking back and reading that prophecy, was symbolic. When the Messiah comes, he's going to come in peace. And then suddenly, here's Jesus fulfilling it literally as well, riding in on an actual donkey. And so it became extra clear that uh, he is fulfilling prophecy in its figurative meaning as well as in its literal meaning. And John tells us that the disciples didn't understand this at first. But of course they remembered it, and after Jesus was glorified, crucified, and raised from the dead, they looked back and pieced it together. And he rode in on a donkey. This is what Zechariah was talking about. The prophets were talking about Jesus. And so we can put our trust in Jesus because we have the historical evidence of his resurrection. And we have the evidence of fulfilled prophecy showing that this is all in God's big plan for the world to save his people and bring his kingdom, which we are invited to be part of. So who do you identify with in what we've heard this morning? Maybe we uh, could see ourselves in the crowds shouting praise to Jesus and that great excitement as he's arriving, recognizing him as the King of Israel, the Savior. Maybe some of us, if we're honest, feeling a bit more like the Pharisees and the chief priests who don't want Jesus as king. And Judas is so frustrated with Jesus and doesn't want him to be loved. Maybe we can identify with the different disciples at their different stages in their journey. Perhaps Mary, who has experienced so much love from Jesus, that she can't but love him in return. May the Lord work in each of us and bring us to that point in our relationship with Jesus. Amen.